Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Scunnered Instrument. Uh, right. Words. Words. New words. Uh, shall I take, shall I go first this time? I, I don't mind. Yeah, either way. Okay. Uh, I'm doing the word instrument. Oh. And so. Nice. Uh, I'm excited. My first I mean, obviously, the first thing, well, I mean, maybe not obviously, the first thing I think of is music, musical instrument. Yeah, sure. Um, but it was one of the, it's one of those words where the more I think of it, I kind of, it slowly dawns on me that there are other senses that I do, in fact, know and sometimes use. But when I first immediately think of it, I just think, well, it means a musical instrument and that's it. And then yes. I think, well, no, because you have like scientific instruments. And you have legal instruments like a like a mortgage or a contract or a deed, um, especially in Britain. Actually, Scottish law uses a lot of the word instrument, but statutory instruments are also used. That's obviously oh, a lot whoa, more esoteric. Oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, it has just occurred to me uh-huh. that oh my god. What? I'm very sorry. I apologise in advance. This just occurred to me. This is the first time I've spoken to you since you've actually become a full-on card-carrying, sticker-designing liar. Well, no, no, well, not quite yet. <clears throat> ah, d- d- Peshaw. Peshaw and Peshui. There's always more. What I, I, I did pass the bar There's exams. There's always more. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Congratulations, yeah. dude. Well, well, thank you. So that's, it's handy to not have that hanging over me anymore. I still have another three months of articling to do. Three, four, four months? Three months. Whatever. I, I don't, I, I don't know how you, you like, you managed, you, you, you'd really managed to convince me that you probably weren't going to pass it first time round. Like, I, I don't know if it was just your incredible low keyness or if, or if you really believe that you weren't going to pass it, but I think you, thi- you were, yeah. It's you, so you shrouded so... in general that it's really genuinely hard to tell. Like they don't tell you what the passing grade is. You you have no idea what you're doing when you go into it. There's you know there are practice exams, but it's it's incredibly hard to study for because you just don't know what's there. <laughs> so for the first exam, for the barrister Dick exam, I basically lawyers. nearly nearly killed myself and made my children forget who I was by just spending every spare moment for several weeks in a row reading my face off. And then for the second one, I kind of went, you know what, I did all that studying and I still had to look up every word. So what I did for the second 1100 page package of information is I read the first 12 pages and then I just worked on a couple of tables of contents and went, eh, whatever happens, happens. And so... (laughs) You've just described my entire academic career in in micro there. Yeah. That was a... So... I'm glad I'm glad I did that for the second one now that I've passed. I would have felt like a bit of a twit if I had passed the barrister and not the solicitor exam. But uh yeah, so that's there. So I, I have to finish the articles and then I have to just wait for the powers that be to hand me my relevant piece of paper. But now it's basically just running out the clock. As long as I don't get fired or arrested before January, I'm good to go. Fingers crossed, dude. Fingers crossed. Yeah, I think I can do it. <laughs> Mom was I like, mean, if, I'm pretty if, sure you can do it. So I was like, okay, good. If guys. Canada's anything like the UK at the moment, there's nowhere to go and nothing to do. So it's it's fairly difficult to get arrested it's under those Genuinely, the, like I've played one show in all of 2020, so I have never been further from being arrested in my entire life. Yeah. It's yeah. great. I feel like it, maybe it, like I just, I've just had two weeks off school and I've been bored out of my trolley, particularly because the two weeks that Ross had off school were not the same two weeks that I had off school. Oh. So we actually only had one week overlapped holiday. And the second week I was just I spent three days in the house by myself watching crappy TV and making things straight out of will. But um <laughs> I kept thinking, like, what is there I can do? I totally could have gone and got arrested. It's true. It's I one of the few like things I, you can do. Yeah, I've missed a trick. You can there. still do. But my point is that now when you talk about instruments of the law, 
you do so from a legal place. <laughs> yes, from a legal place. You do so. You do so from a a position of authority and qualifications, and you're now a legal expert, and nothing you can say will convince me otherwise. Proceed. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Uh, so yeah, so yes, so legal instruments are now a thing that I deal with on a relatively regular basis. Uh, interestingly enough, I'm going to start for the second time in a row. I'm going to go to Smith pretty early, simply because he has a pretty fantastic. I mean, all of his breakdowns are generally fantastic, but yeah, we love Smith. He has it lumped in with tool and implement. Mm, delicious. And this this he's is sort almost of, like device again. Yeah, exactly. He sort of jumps on the last sense, the 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 scientific instruments sense. Which is kind of the last one I thought of when I kind of went through my list of things that instrument meant. But anyway, he says, uh, comparing tool and implement, he says, The character of a tool is simplicity, of an implement, technical adaptation, of an instrument, scientific ingenuity and effectiveness. One speaks of the tools of a carpenter, of the implements of husbandry, of the instruments of an, astro of an astronomer. Oh, the nice. implement goes to perform a work with which it be, with which, uh, sorry the implement goes to perform a work with which it comes into physical contact the instrument is a scientific invention for multiplying and enhancing the faculties and powers of men so it's that kind of and this is sort of i also think of specifically the lab from the mel brooks movie young frankenstein <laughs> the, the the greatest Halloween movie that's ever been made, hands down. I will take no questions. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. But Absolutely. I am with you there. I'll pack up the projector for you and yeah. everything. And I mean, I guess other Frankenstein movies too, but whatever. Th those, that, you know, the, the convoluted, finicky, technically finicky, slightly bizarre, almost mystically scientific things that are measuring and detecting and all that other stuff. So that's, Just, Smith jumps yeah. on to that one. The... The sense of musical instrument is is actually the earliest cited in the OED, which is which is very interesting to me. Mm. So it goes back to the year thirteen hundred. The legal instrument sense is also from the fourteenth century, but it's the other end. So it's thirteen ninety one is the first citation for legal instrument, and it's I don't know if there, I I don't know if I'm right about this, but my sense is. My sort of instinct is because, A, so many examples of certain classes of words come from early legal documents, and because legal jargon and language is so esoteric normally, and almost always not important enough, but needs to be specific enough that it ends up in writing and not in spoken words so much that my sense is that this is an example of where we can probably rely on the written citation as being an actual, like much, much closer to the first actual beginning of usage, if that makes okay. sense. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I doubt very much that there were lots of people out there in the popular culture at the time of the 1400 or the 14th century using the phrase legal instrument before they got around to writing it down. Yeah. So I think what you're saying is, even in the 14th century, no one actually spoke the way that lawyers write. Yes, that's exactly what I think. <laughs> I don't know if that's... I don't know that that's true, but I'm pretty sure that's true. <laughs> so, uh, and then around the same time... And the reason I say this is because technically the first use in the OED for a tool used to perform a piece of work, sense of instrument, is from 1392. But that one I kind of feel probably was... I'm much more confident in saying that was probably in use much, much earlier than that and only got written down in 1392. So my thought is that the legal instrument usage was probably the last one to come, or, come about. I have to it... tell you something awesome that I learned about the word tool. Okay. So since lockdown started, the husband has been learning German on Duolingo. Nice. Because some people, it would seem react to the end of the world by getting really fucking productive. Ugh. Not that there's anything wrong with that or anything. Well, <sighs> isn't there? <laughs> He's also a morning person, just in case you were wondering. Oh. But, uh... 
cup, really. <laughs> no, I'm very impressed with his uh, with his discipline and. Yes. I was about to say stickability, and then I realised I'm not in a like public information film made for children, and I can't think of the word that I actually mean. But he's he's still doing it. Right. Um. But yeah. So he's been he's been learning German, and German is a really fascinating in, uh, instrument. It's a really fascinating language for lots and lots of reasons. Yeah. It and is. Uh, he discovered that he was he was telling me about this. He discovered that the German word for tool. That there are more than there's more than one German word for tool. In fact, one of the German words that means tool is das Instrument. Oh, but, cool. But uh, one of the words for tool is Werkzeug. <laughs> That's spelled W E R K Z E U G. And the cool <laughs> thing about the word Werkzeug is that Werk means work. Yeah. And Zeug means. <laughs> oh. This this fits in so beautifully with our very very precise manner of describing things. <laughs> Zeug means stuff. Oh, that's awesome. So the German word for one of the German words for tool literally means work stuff. Oh, it was already instantly my favorite German word of all time. Because just because it's Werkzeug. Yeah, because why wouldn't it be? And now, now that I know it means work stuff. Work stuff. Oh. Yeah, so like, if you're a carpenter, then your work stuff is like a, you know, nails and a hammer, hammer and a and saw, stuff, yeah. and and if you're a musician, then your work stuff is your instrument, or if you're a, a an artist, then your work stuff is paint and brushes and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. That's so fantastic. <laughs> well done, German. Good work. Yeah, good on you, German. <laughs> uh, now, interestingly, so. All this stuff is happening around the late, you know, the end of the 1300s. So, as one might expect, Chaucer features fairly heavily in the early citations of a lot of these words. Yay! Interestingly, and I mean, this is just a testament, I think, to Chaucer's incredible versatility and diversity in his written materials and styles and abilities, because he is the earliest citation in the OED for the following two senses of the word instrument, okay? Mm. Sense one, <clears throat> a device for registering, measuring, recording a physical uh, a physical quantity, property, or phenomenon. So that's the finicky young Frankenstein lab instruments sense. Sure. Chaucer's number one on the citation list for that. He is also number one on the citation for the sense of the instrument, meaning the penis. Hey! So... You can always rely on Chaucer to bring the penis. You can always <laughs> rely on Chaucer. It's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's just, there's Chaucer so I... for you. That's, I feel like that's, if someone needed like a very, 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 just like the elevator pitch of Chaucer, it's like, <clears throat> he introduced. High literature plus penises. And also many, many, many examples of various ways to describe genitalia. And that's, and there's Chaucer. So when I when I was but a young undergraduate, um I <laughs> so I, I, I got to I got to maybe third year at uni before I encountered Chaucer. And so in Scotland we have one examination system and in England they have another examination system. So okay. basically what this means is you do a sort of a, a fairly generic common core curriculum up until the age of 16 and then you become a lot more specialised for in Scotland the the qualifications that basically that allow you entry to university they are one year courses and in England they are two year courses in Scotland the maximum you can do is usually five or sometimes six and in England it's three or perhaps four okay so English A levels um, are designed in a completely different way but quite often Chaucer is an English A level text so right. at university where I was terrified of everyone and had all the imposter syndrome and felt like everyone was cleverer than me about everything, uh, Chaucer came up in whatever course I was doing and I was immediately terrified because A, it was foreign and B, everybody else would have done uh, Chaucer before because I went to university in St Andrews and as a Scottish person at the University of St Andrews, I was basically an ethnic minority. Right. So... um. So I, I sat down with my, and it was a big chunky book. It was a massive brick of a book, my 
collective uh, collected uh, works of Chaucer. And I started to read, and it was the Canterbury Tales, and I started reading The Miller's Tale, and I got about three pages in before <laughs> I realised that I was basically reading a medieval carry-on film. Yeah. And oh, 100%. Since then, Chaucer has been... Like, he's he's a top three author, without a doubt. Oh, yeah. He's fantastic. Yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, high literature <laughs> plus, uh, plus, plus rude bits. Yeah. I, I said that... <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, once again, dear listener, this is one of my behind the scenes moments. <laughs> sometimes, uh, sometimes Ryan and I manage to get together for long enough to record two episodes at once, and um, this is one of these occasions. So when I I got up to go and and get set up, um, my husband said, "Do you have a word?" As Ryan's wife would say to him, "Do you have a word?" Um, and I said, "Oh, actually, I have two words," and. He said, just to give you a little insight in, into the sort of high intellectual discourse that happens in my house, he said, are they cock and balls? <laughs> 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 and I said, I said, no, all the while thinking, why aren't my two words cock and balls? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, basically, we're as, we're as intellectual as Chaucer. That's what I'm saying. I feel like, yeah, I'm fine with that. I'm 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 great with that actually. Uh, so instrument. Anyway. Um, so instrument penis onwards. Exactly. So <laughs> the word essentially is it's a Latin root again, and the Latin word is instruere, which means according to Adam Online, uh, arrange, prepare, set in order, inform, or teach, and this is where we get instruct from. Okay. Same like exactly the same Latin root. And it literally. Well, I was just wondering about structure, as in building things. Well, there you go. It literally means to build on or to build up. Ah, oh, nice. Because it's the that prefix in again, um, which can also mean, mean in. it can mean in, it can mean on, it, to, together, like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And the root struere, which is from the pi root stere, and that means to build or to pile. And awesome. It's, but. <laughs> Sort of. <laughs> so, the struere. I really, really, really want that that pie root to have given us stalactites and stalagmites. Oh, I didn't see that. Maybe, maybe I'm making that up. Who knows? Maybe it was just the sense of piling. Yeah. Well, so this this struere thing, the Latin, it was was piling, and the but the pie root it. <laughs> It seems it's one of these things that it seems to have two, to me, completely different meanings. Indeterminate. Pie. So the one is build, but the other sense is to spread, and I, do, I feel like those are opposites. But it, as a result of the, those two senses, and and this is what it's entirely possible is that I have conflated these two, and they are. It's one of those examples where, um. They're, they're actually just two completely different words that happen to be spelled the same. And I'm conflating two different pi roots. Yeah, sure. One of them means to build happens. and one of them means to spread because sometimes that happens because language has always been kind of stupid. Um, <laughs> but the building words that we get from this are words like construct, structure, mm -hmm. destructive and destroy. Obstruction is another one. Mm -hmm. But we also get industry strewn ah, from the nice. spread side of it stratagem and also perestroika comes from this beautiful idea as well which is interesting i didn't yeah i, I didn't see stalactite or stalagmite oh, i'm not I'll sure i'll have to look those up another day i'll have to look those up i i do always it, one of the things i'm indebted well one of many things i'm indebted to my dad about, especially with like language and etymology and stuff. <clears throat> He's very good at uh, mnemonic devices and trying to, and remembering just mnemonic devices for remembering things. Has he got a, a good one for stalactites and stalactites? Cause yeah. I always forget. Because stalactites hang, like there's a, the C, the stalactites, the mm -hmm. C, stalactites hang off of the ceiling and stalagmites are on the ground. That's so the wonderful. C and the stalag 
for the G for ground and the stalagmites are the really ones that good. come up. Stalactite comes down. From, yeah. The the other one that I've heard now th this it's a shitty mnemonic because it talks about how tights are something that you pull up. Except you may have noticed that tights can also be pulled down. <laughs> so that's no use. So while I, I remember the mnemonic that's supposed to help me remember the thing, it doesn't actually help me to remember the thing, but ceiling and ground is perfect. Yeah. Good like work, it... Daddy Ryan, good work. Yeah, it's... Uh... So that that was one thing that I... And uh, Okay, right. I just looked it up real quick. because You know those moments where you're like... You have a thing in your head and you're like... This is this is just this is just fact. This is I can rely on this, and I have relied on this. And it's one of those things where it's like ever since I heard that, I've never mixed them up. I can always tell which is which now because I have this very simple mnemonic that works. And then it's as soon as you ironclad. tell it to someone else, and then I said it out loud, and I was like, doubt. "What if I've just messed it up entirely?" Yeah. And so I had to look it up again. But yes, no, it is true. So yeah, the C for ceiling, the G in stalagmites for ground, and. Uh, so now you cool. now you know which way is up if you ever wake up with a burlap sack over your head and you pull it off and you're in a cave and you There's nothing quite like that 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 feeling of fear is is there? Yeah. Like when someone says to you I I've been talking to one of my one of my very good friends who's also an English teacher and she was talking about how being an English teacher and marking lots of children's work absolutely ruins your sense of spelling and grammar. Oh, yeah. Because you find yourself looking at the same mistake so many times that you're like, is that even... Am I the stupid how, one here? How, is this me? Is there a comma? How does... What even is a comma? Oh, my God. And <clears throat> like for me personally, the word alliteration yeah. has been ruined for me. I had to come up with my own mnemonic for spelling alliteration after being an English teacher for two or three years because... I just, it was it was absolutely screwing with my brain. I had to look it up every time. <laughs> is it the one but, L versus um, two L thing? Yes. So you know what? So the way I remember it yeah, okay. is all the sounds are the same. Oh, uh, okay. So it's two let two L's, like all. Two um, two of my, I, it's funny. I, I've meant to look it up and I think I did look it up at one point. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so uh, Mark Sundrum of The Endless Knot is on Twitter as alliterative. With two L's. That's right. And then uh, so is Alice Fraser. And Alice Fraser is alliterative with one L. So yes. I follow and and thoroughly enjoy following uh, two people on Twitter with both potential spellings of alliterative. So neither, I can't use, I mean, Mark, Mark is the more scholarly of the two. So I can kind of use that to remind myself, right? No, the, Mark is the proper way and Al Alice is the pun way. And so that's great. So that's kind of a, a mnemonic that I can use now, but it was, <laughs> it's interesting that I follow the two different alliteratives on Twitter. <laughs> but again, I'm so used to looking at that word and seeing it as A-L-I-T that it, it took me quite a long time to realise that, that Alice Fraser's was deliberately misspelled. <clears throat> right. Cool. Also, I found a commonality. I just discovered, so uh, Mortimer and Whitehouse Gone Fishing... Oh. is just, yeah, amazing. I love it. It's I, it's another, I can't binge it because I always need to have an episode I haven't seen yet just in case I have like, sort of a slightly off day. We're and not I just binging it either. Pour a cup of tea and just watch one episode and just feel better about life. But There's just of, something really heartwarming about Bob Mortimer falling over. It, totally. <laughs> and and the, the richness of Paul Whitehouse's laugh that can only be... <laughs> accomplished when seeing a very old friend a very old dear friend fall over is <laughs> yeah. it's just great it's just it's just so beautiful but watching just everything about it is so beautiful it is watching uh, the episode the one i watched last night i hadn't known that bob mortimer was a lawyer in a past life oh yeah yeah he was a solicitor that's right and so i now know that two of my favorite comedians Alice Fraser and Bob Mortimer have that in common that they were both they ah. both left law to go brilliantly into comedy which <laughs> which makes me think that maybe this whole thing maybe this whole law school malarkey is is just basically an entrance exam for my future burgeoning com <laughs> comic career I don't know I mean I think oh I do God. know but Becca would actually murder you oh she would <laughs> she must never hear this episode <laughs> 
remember that time that you worked so hard to help me go through law school? I think I might go become a stand-up comic. <laughs> Dearly beloved, okay. we're gathered when... here to remember the... <laughs> When I when I called Ross to say, uh, I want to give up my job, he said, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's nice when people uh, understand uh, you, you know? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Oh. I was thinking, mm -hmm. because, because I also think of musical instruments, um, first and foremost, but I remember as a little kid... So I, I was raised Catholic and, um, you know, there's there's no God in that for anybody. And <laughs> <laughs> so I spent countless hours of my life in church as a child, bored. Um, and th But fortunately, there were lots of really good words to listen to and loads of really cool words to read. So, um, yeah, I was I was that kind of kid. Yeah. So the Lord make me an instrument of your peace. Hmm. Um, sort of pop, popped into my head because I first I first encountered that that particular prayer via a hymn um, and the hymn is make me a channel of your peace and oh, then okay. I later read it as make me an instrument of your peace and I've also seen it as make me a means of your peace right I think channel and means uh, essentially scan better in a line of music and that's yeah. probably why a different translation was was used. But I always really, I was always really fascinated by this this idea of being an instrument of peace because, um, because my my brain immediately thought of a musical instrument that didn't make any sound. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know it's a long, boring, often quite cold hour at church. You have to make your own entertainment. But um, <laughs> to to those of you that find a, a rich fulfilled spiritual experience through attending church and and in these apocalyptic apocalyptic times perhaps miss that spiritual experience yeah. i'm so glad that you have that but i never did right. um anyway uh, interestingly yeah, so... that's another thing that smith picked up on which is which i thought was a little bit weird and i've forgotten about until you said that is that tool when used metaphorically tool can be kind of uh either or but instrument is almost always used just as a a means to accomplish something good. So an instrument yeah, of peace, but a tool of destruction. And an so instrument of... See, I would... It's a bit like the, the, the siege engines, like an instrument of war. Yeah, I don't... I mean, I I didn't I didn't quite all the way buy it, but it was interesting that they had that, that sense, that sort of, I don't know, value judgment attached yeah. to the words tool versus instrument um, good instrument bad tool well i i have a word i have a word for you okay a word for everyone a word for 2020 oh brought to you all the way from scotland now i i love scots and i could i could basically bring a different scots word every week yeah safe in the knowledge that most of our <clears throat> listeners certainly the ones who aren't in scotland and who are not scots speakers won't have heard of this word before yeah and it's it's always nice to learn a new word, you know. It's it's good, but I I want I actively want people to have this word in their life because there's something so incredibly pleasing about saying it, and it it kind of ties into my whole 2020 experience. Right. Whereby, I mean, I'm I'm not going to tell you the entire story of my emotional life again, <laughs> <laughs> but but I've like over the past sort of four or five years. I've done a lot of kind of like self inquiry therapy learning kind of stuff. So for all of you that just rolled your eyes and went fucking yoga teacher, I, I, that's okay. I get it. Um, <laughs> part of it was that. So so yoga is, is like one of the methods by which I would say I've kind of gotten to know myself and my body and my kind of mind a lot better. But but you know all of that stuff is kind of my jam because I had a horrible nervous breakdown and I wanted to just never have ever happen again. So. So yeah, so all of that, all of that kind of stuff going on, and and basically the point that I've reached with all of of this stuff, um, I, I said to someone this week, um, my Pilates teacher again, I roll perfectly welcome, but we were talking about that sort of spiritual woo woo world of of yoga and movement and dance and and people who wear or organic deodorant, and. Um, and I said it's very hard to be in those worlds when you're Scottish, you know, because there's just there's there's an essential 
fundamental part of you at all times going, what the fuck? <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's tricky. But anyway, I'm not in any way dissing those worlds. I've been a part of them and probably will be a part of them again. And full disclosure, I also wear organic deodorant because there's nothing wrong with that. Also, it works. Anyway, <laughs> um, I've now out-tangented myself so tangentially, Ryan, that I've forgotten my own tangent. <laughs> uh, Scott's word. Scott's word. Yes, I, I remember now. So, so I've, I've basically <laughs> gotten to a point. I think the, the sort of best way to describe my philosophy, there's a guy who describes it as negative self-help. And <laughs> negative self-help addresses the terrible, terrible blight of toxic positivity. Oh, okay. I don't, know if you've, I don't know if you've heard of this before, but toxic positivity is what drives those terrible fucking T-shirts that say things like, good vibes only. Oh, right. Yeah. So those of you that were rolling your eyes, trust me, my eyes love a good roll. And this sense of everything being happy and great and as long as you can find the positive in things, everything will be okay and... and being grateful and having a practice of uh, uh, all that. I'm like, yes, all of that stuff is good and has a place. Right, yeah. However, read the fucking room. Let's have a bit of perspective here, you know? Right, yeah, <clears throat> exactly. Telling telling someone to be grateful for the things that they have is, is fine. If the things that they have are enough to satisfy their basic needs. Telling someone who is like, you know, struggling to feed their kids to have a gratitude practice, that that's kind of a dick move. Yeah. So so yeah, this exactly. whole toxic positivity thing um, upsets me greatly. And I, and I do my best to, to kind of avoid it in my own life and in my own communications. And I and I call it out when I see it because, you know, I've, I've been in that place and, and it, it sort of leads to this whole, like, I'm trying to improve myself and make my life better and make my internal world a better place to be. But actually you're telling me that I'm doing it wrong. So... Obviously, I'm shit at this stuff, and then that's this whole other set of problems. Like, people should not be shamed for not feeling good. Right, yeah. And that brings us neatly back to 2020, where, let's face it, quite a lot of shitty things have been going on. Yeah. Like, newsflash. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if anyone needs to get this from a podcast. To, to but... those of you who just got here. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, and, and, like, I... Give give the due to gratitude. I am an incredibly fortunate human being. My life is pretty nice. I have, yeah. I have a comfortable life. I have a home. I have good relationships. I, I have material stuff. I'm financially comfortable. I'm very, very lucky and I'm very, very grateful for all of those privileged things. Um, but one of the things that's really, really doing my box in about 2020 is people looking on the bright side. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's okay as far as I'm concerned it is eminently okay to point out the shit show of 2020 yeah and and this I think this this is becoming much more you know a, a sort of a mainstream message it's okay not to be okay but in practice is it okay not to be okay people don't want to seem like they're complaining or they don't want to be a downer or they don't want to like, yeah be negative and all that stuff. And and I feel like quite a lot of the hard work of 2020 is having to deal with all the people who are desperately denying that things are not that great. <laughs> I'd much yeah. rather everyone just said, do you know what? This is rubbish. I hate not being able to do things. Yeah. I hate not being able to see my friends. It sucks that hugging is no longer a thing other yeah. than within a very small number of people that you live with and see all the time anyway. So... Quite frankly, I am 120% scunnered with 2020. Scunnered? And scunnered is my word of the week. Oh, that's fantastic. S-C-U-N-N-E-R-E-D. Scunnered. Now, scunner, although it's a, Scot a Scots word, it is in the OED. And it's in the OED as a verb, scunner. Okay. However... Uh, scunner can also be used as a noun. Now, that sense isn't in the OED, but I'll talk to you about, a bit more about that in a minute. Okay. It is of obscure origin. Yay! Nice, hooray! Yeah, we, we like those. The, the sense naturally suggests connection with shun, and I'll get to the sense in a minute. 
so says the OED, but there is no variant with SH and no cognate verb in Scandinavian. The okay. Suffix is apparently the frequentative ER suffix. But compare the early, earlier synonym, scurn. So scurn is a verb, S-C-U-R-N, okay. which means it's, it's obsolete and it means to shrink, flinch or take fright. Huh. Now, that's not quite what scurner means, although the first sense given in the OED, again obsolete, is to shrink back with fear or to flinch. The one that's, that's being used in my particular context here is to be affected with violent disgust or Ooh. to feel sick or to disgust or to, to sicken. And there is this sense of, of disgust, but also I think that, that to be scunnered has this sense of long suffering, put up with this shit for quite some time now. Enough! Done! Yeah. Scunnered. Scunnered. So I had a wee look at the Dictionary of the Scots Language. Okay. which is a really fascinating website to have a look at, dsl.ac.uk. And Scunner, which is a variant S-C-H-U-N-N-E-R, which I've, I've never seen before. <laughs> um, we, we have a wonderful citation given from uh, Robin Jenkins, the Scots author, from a, a work called Just Duffy from 1988. Shit in itself didn't scunner her. It was natural, <laughs> like fallen leaves. <laughs> We then have some some other fantastic uh, citations. James Kelman. Uh, oh, no, no, it's no that. I just get fucking scunnered with it. I don't blame you. These last couple of weeks. So, yeah, he, here is the sense. Being scunnered is, is reaching the end of just... Oh, Jesus, man, enough. Yeah. You can be scunnered. Okay. Something can also be a scunner. Oh, that's a total scunner. Right, okay. And the, the Scots Lang Scotch Language Dictionary also gave me... Now, I, I'd never actually seen this variation before, but I absolutely love it. Uh, you can have a scunneration. Oh. So, a, a scunneration. Scunneration. A, a thing which causes someone to be scunnered. To be scunnered, okay. Other variations include, um, as well as scunneration, we have uh, scunnersome. I like um, that. There was another one, scun or some. Oh no, maybe I'm blethering. It was maybe only two. Being scunnered can happen for for all sorts of reasons. It can be, um, you know, someone who's a wee bit annoying, and you get scunnered with them. Uh, it can be the interminable march on of of terrible, terrible pandemic, murder hornets, American <laughs> Civil War sort yeah. of year. Um, but it's it's a wonderful way, and there's there's something about the sound of the word, for me that that just so beautifully expresses that sense of. Of disdain and disgust, and of, of just having had enough of this. Yeah, it's great. It's, yeah, it's it's one of these onomatopoeic words that that isn't onomatopoeic. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of short but sweet. It, it, it says what it needs to say. I should also point out another one of my favourite Scots words. Um, often one becomes scunnered when one has had to thole something. Have I spoken about this word before? I'm getting deja vu. No, I don't, well, I don't think so. Thole, T-H-O-L-E. Uh, to, to thole something is to put up with it. Oh, okay. So for all those of you who are thole in 2020 with a, a, fa a fake false smile plastered onto your face, take it from me, there is nothing wrong every now and again with let letting people know that you are scunnered. Oh, that's fantastic. I do like that. It's, yeah, and it does have a, yeah, that onomatopoeic, but not, but yes, quality I think we should it, just like... call them non-omatopoeias. That's my... Oh, that's fantastic. A non I love that. non <laughs> That's going to happen. It's the new thing. Uh, yeah, scunnered. That's very cool. And it works really well in a Canadian accent. I wasn't sure how that was going to go. Yeah, it, I mean, it's not. It's not obviously not nearly as good as, the, as this, <laughs> those quotes, which were fantastic. But There uh, are some... Uh, well, it, 
will I give you some more Scots language porn? Uh, yes. A wee shout out this week to uh, the comedian Janie Godley. If you're not aware of Janie Godley, you you really should be. She's on Twitter and she's she's kind of kept the nation sane through the pandemic. Um, the the first minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, who I, I am you know I'm I'm very very well documented as saying that I'm not a Scots nationalist. Although these days I would vote for independence in an less than a heartbeat. Well, yeah. Um, but the but the leader of the SNP, Nicola Sturgeon, has been admirable throughout the, the pandemic. She's, you know, whether whether you believe in her politics or not, she is... Right. I think in, in stark contrast to other political leaders, shall we say, <laughs> uh, she has been measured and calm and sensible and human about about the whole thing. And uh, Janie Godley is a, a Scottish comedian who who makes parody videos of the, the First Minister. And she's been doing this for a long time, but of course, obviously, you know, these days it's like, there's there's weekly briefings and, and lots of press conferences and things like that. And basically what, what Janie Godley does is she she translates what Nicola Sturgeon seems to be thinking um, and, and says that instead of what she actually said. Oh, oh yeah, and okay, yes, I have seen these. Do you, do you know the comedian you're talking yeah. about? But uh, just just this week, she was. Uh, it was announced that Janie Godley is the Scots Speaker of the Year, which is an award that is given every year. So I was I was very pleased to to hear that and to see that. But uh, some more scunnery. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I've just made that one up. Uh, when he did, we fund a half finished packet of pan drops on the bedside table. That would a scunner him, they do. That for him would be Dean of Fori's time. <laughs> wow. Do you need a translation? Uh, probably, yeah. Uh, I got when, some of it. He, when he died, we found a half finished packet of pan drops, are, um, oh, what's the word that's used for that? Uh, mint druggies. Mm, okay. Do you know what a druggie is? It's a wonderful word that used it's it's uh, mentos. Oh, okay. You know the fruit mentos that you get? Yeah. I eat a lot of those in Korea and they, they are specifically called on the packaging it says that they are chewy draggies. Oh okay. Degree, draggy is the type of sweet. And it's a word you hardly ever see see used. But uh, in Scotland we call them pan drops, the the mint ones particularly. Okay. They're sort of like mentos that are a little bit harder. Right, okay. So when he died we found a half finished packet of pan drops on the bedside table. That would have scunnered him. He would have been really annoyed about that, no doubt. That for him would be dying before his time. <sighs> nice. Yes, and fair scunner to the teeth the day you saw your cell there. You hear the look of Lazarus gone moonstruck over the day. <laughs> is this just gonna? Is this podcast just gonna become me reading out um, excerpts from from brilliant Scots works? It is extraordinarily possible. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of down with that. Yeah. yeah, it'll be like the that'll roads be the I agenda. throng we folk, but what I stand is a scunneration to me. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> the road's always busy with people, but where I stand is very annoying to me. Right, that's great. Yeah. Scunneration, scunnery, scunnered. That's awesome. So how? Because <laughs> so what? I've I've got what I've got one more for you. <laughs> okay. It's a Kelpie talking. A Kelpie is a Scots mythological beast. And the Kelpies are best known for the, the amazing uh, sculptures uh, at Falkirk. If you have a look at the Kelpies, they're two enormous horse head uh, sculptures and they're, they're, they're just glorious, absolutely beautiful. Cool. Um, so the Kelpie says, See trying to gallop a wah with any muckle virgins on my back and me my webbed hoofs and all. It's pure scunner, some pal. <laughs> <laughs> Which means wow. trying to gallop away with one of those large virgins on my back when I've got webbed hoofs. It's very annoying. <laughs> well, it would be. <laughs> yeah, you, you can imagine. Nightmare. Oh, man. That's Absolute awesome. scunneration. Total scunneration. Those, and they would be the instruments of their scunneration. <laughs> yes. That's <laughs> And that's it for another episode of Lexitecture. To get in touch with us about something you heard in this episode, you can email us at words at lexitecture.com. You can also follow along and talk to us at Lexitecture on Facebook and Twitter and at Lexitecture Podcast on Instagram. 
For back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexatexture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.